successful RMA program. You know, I think most of us at some point uh, during radar operations that are not been in our office have tuned in and looked at the radar and other offices and you know professionally second guess what's going on. And we're curious about the information being received by the warning teams or what warning decisions were being made. And we've seen successful operations and operations that could have gone better as we've watched from afar. But this really, this mutual aid idea is to provide expert assistance to um, warning operations uh, because we've got experts out there that have availability, uh, desire to do this. And I think um, it's an opportunity to expand our partners' service and our reliability of these weather warnings. What this isn't is centralized warnings. This is not an attempt to take warnings away from the WFO. You're the expert. Uh, you, you draw the polygon, you pull the trigger. It's your warning decision. This is input. And you'll have to forgive me while I uh, give an, an, an analogy that I talked about earlier with, but. Uh, when I watched uh, several years ago, Tom Brady in a, in a very unfortunate Super Bowl against Kansas City, um, I noticed that uh, the quarterback, uh, Tom Brady, had a coach in his ear by a, uh, an earpiece. And it got me thinking, how does one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time need a coach in the gr biggest game of all time? He's at the top of his profession, the most capable person potentially on the planet doing that work, yet he needs coaching on every play. And it struck me that this person um, didn't need basic level coaching. They needed information that perhaps someone with a different point of view could see. They're looking at a different point of the field. They have different information available and they have different pressures or time pressures. Um, so they would provide information to the quarterback who would still make the final call, still execute the play and always have the opportunity to audible to make a change to the plan as the situation warranted. Um, very similar to this now, the, the quarterback is the warning decision maker. We're gonna put a coach in their ear if, if wanted, and this will provide them information, uh, maybe from SPC, maybe from another warning operator, uh, maybe from another expert in a WFO, and uh, give them information and options, and the quarterback, the warning decision operator, will still execute the play and still make the decision. This is not, uh, as I said, this is not centralized warnings by any means. And this isn't trying to get around staffing offices that have uh, additional needs because of convection or staffing shortages or things like that. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to provide better service to our partners, to protect life and property and give the best service that we can. And um, don't, don't read anything else into it. It's trying to get better at what we're doing. And uh, we have really good expertise out there and people want to participate and we're doing it informally anyway. I look at the radar. I, I used to know what I was looking at, Ariel. I'm not sure I'm qualified to sit on the radar anymore, but uh, um, let's, let's take advantage of our expertise for the work that's already being done and work together to provide better service to our partners. And we're gonna save lives. I mean, that's really why we're doing this. So thank you for the team for jumping on this, being very proactive and uh, hope you give it a, give it a good listen and uh, think about the opportunity we have to serve our partners better. So with that, Randy, I'll toss it back to you. Hey, thanks, Ken, for those opening comments. And with that, we'll turn it over to Ariel and crew. Take it away, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor to be able to present um, with a group of people who have been so passionate about the idea of extending mutual aid to the convective warning time frame. Ken, thank you so much for all those introductory remarks. The uh, analogy that you brought up was absolutely perfect in the sense that, you know, we, we, we've heard the phrase before, you know, you, you know, we can't do it all alone. Well, well, we may be able to, that quarterback may be able to do it all alone, but look at how much more we can do when we open our walls up to other people to help out. When we ask other people on our team to help us out, accomplish something, we're able to do so much more. That's really what mutual aid is getting at. And I'm actually in Las Vegas right now. Um, you can see I'm in my hotel room. I'm making a, a run for the coast, uh, uh, Pacific coast in uh, just a couple of hours. And last night, as many of you know, I got to know Kim Runk, 
used to be the director of the Operations Proving Ground. Um, he's here in Las Vegas and I had a chance to have an evening discussion with him last night and reflect back to our times when we were initially creating the, the, the Mesoanalyst Boot Camps. And one of the main findings from the Mesoanalyst Boot Camp, and for those of you who are not aware, the Mesoanalyst Boot Camps were an organized process of developing expertise within a cadre of individuals who are very passionate about applying the detailed analysis of meteorology to the say one to six hour time frame to anticipate potential outcomes of, of, of severe weather scenarios based on the environment. And then to communicate that in the form of enhanced levels of decision support services by not just working themselves, but really applying the collaborative process for approaching meteorology and enhancing service delivery by communicating that within a team environment. Really, convective warning mutual aid is an extension of that to the, the, the very near-term time scale, T, uh, time equals zero to, to maybe 45 minutes or so. And as we know that the central region has taken a very proactive role in developing the remote mesoanalyst group that is was a direct finding from the convective warning, uh, excuse me, the uh, the, the, the um, mesoanalyst boot camps um, that really, really bring to light the principle that we may be able to do it all on our own, but we can do so much better when we help each other out, when we bring in the unique skill sets and expertise and talents across our very diverse organization and bring it together in an organized fashion so that each office can provide the highest level of service. This is not something that's just a new initiative. This is an extension of the same train of thought, helping each other out and harnessing expertise that we cultivate through training, through experience and mentorship so that we're providing the highest level of service delivery. I wanted to give some context here. Uh, since last night, my conversation with Kim really reminded me that this is, this is just a, an extended process of how do we help each other out um, all right, so Harry, why don't we go to the next slide? All right, this brings me into a, an assignment that Ken Harding, Regional Director for Central Region, provided to all of the MICs and HICs for the midterm assignments in uh, fiscal year 22. So as everyone knows, we have the annual performance reviews that occur with our performance plan, and there's a midpoint that has to take place. Well, for our midpoint in fiscal year 22, um, all the MICs and HICs had to provide Ken with a one pager of a big idea. And I'm talking big. I showed some pictures of uh, big things that I've taken from Colorado, supercells over big mountains and a big rainbow. A lot of things just appear much bigger in the sky there, but I, 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 I um, detract a bit from the main point here. The, the idea with this big, uh, the, the idea with a big idea is what transformational concept can help us do a better job in providing the highest quality of services to our partners and customers. And this is something that means so much to me since you know there are things that I myself know that I have a lot of expertise in and there are some things that I don't. Each person brings their own talent, their own expertise. Some people are amazing briefers. Some people are able to get up in a large crowd and conduct themselves in a, extremely professional, very high level of communication way to elicit decision making from our partners. Other people are much better digging into the deep science. Some people live, breathe, eat, sleep, uh, tornadoes and radar meteorology. And, and everyone has their own different niche areas. We all have proficiency across the board. As Ken mentioned, we all need to have a baseline ability so that we're each locally providing the services to our core partners and to our customers. But when we're able to bring in those talents and expertise and we do it collaboratively, not only as a whole region, but a whole agency, think of all of the, the big things that we can do in, in serving our partners with a higher level of quality. All right, let's go to the next slide, Harry. Okay, so this leads us to what I came up for my midterm assignment for Ken, which was the convective warning mutual aid concept. It's really just, the central region remote mesoanalyst concept, very different way of delivering it, but the concept of helping each other out with the niche expertise areas to the warning time scale. Now, there are some challenges that the warning time scale brings up that are unique to the warning time scale that are kind of 
you know, specialized relative to what's going on with the mesoanalysis um, duration. And that is the very fast paced, um, full, complete total observation concept that is that is evolving at a much faster rate. When we're going into that very near term detailed time span, it requires a different approach to the way in which we provide that help and support. And so this required this, this incredible team of individuals um, that, 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 that Ken had me working with SSD, with STID, with um, offices in uh, Topeka and Bismarck, the Storm Prediction Center, um, to originally create this proof of concept that was needed to be tailoring to the warning time scale. Um, and so again, it's just an application of, of, of what we've been doing, but for a, for a very unique dimension of our service. Next slide, Harry. So the basic premise of convective warning mutual aid, as I've been getting at, is to establish, and this is the key point here, an on-demand radar team. So whenever you want, you have a radar team available to you. If you don't want it, that's completely understood. If you want the expertise, it's there on demand that draws upon sub, uh, subject matter expertise that specifically a cadre of individuals who have developed that expertise, they're constantly training, they're constantly drilling themselves, they're, 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 they're watching, studying all the time, being involved in research, you know, mentoring, being mentored in the niche area of convection, mesoanalysis, and convective warning decision-making that are all integrated together. Think about the, the data synthesis that's constantly going on, the synergy, I should say, of data that's just occurring at such a fast-paced, deep level when you're issuing warnings. There's so much information that goes into it. And when we're able to pull like, a, all of the different dimensions that could be perceived, thought of, plays in the future by people who are subject matter experts, who have put their lives into understanding convective storms and their evolution and their interactions with the environment, we're able to really have those the, the, that, 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 that collaboration occur in a very efficient manner to improve our services. Um, what this program uses is instead of having a larger group chat, um, having a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-radar team, a Google Meet screen sharing capabilities that bring that subject matter expert into the local office at any point to re really create or complement an already established radar team. Now, of course, I completely acknowledge that every office has that expertise there, which is which is great. And we all know that you know radar meteorology, especially when it comes to fast evolving storms or marginal storms, it's always great to have another opinion, a consensus, work together to see things that you know I might not be seeing myself. I got to admit, you know, I've done a lot of radar work throughout my career. But I benefited when Harry actually came in to join a radar team at our operations, having someone from SPC with another pair of eyes, a different, diverse perspective and opinion. It helped my warning decisions, rather our warning decisions, be that much better. No doubt about it. It's just, I can't, you know, I may be able to think I can do it all, but really can't do it all. we got to help each other out. Next slide, Harry. All right, so how does this work? This works by creating a core group of convective warning experts who are virtually assisting in warning decision making. They're not issuing the warnings, as Ken mentioned. These are people providing guidance, expertise guidance. You know, think about ways in your life when you've sought out expertise guidance, whether in the medical profession or in, uh, you know, in, in, in guidance and education, et cetera. These are, these are what we call the providers. They are the ones that are providing this real-time, on-demand subject matter expertise. Um, they're providing guidance to, to help complement the radar team concept. Um, they are dedicated not only to developing the expertise and the fundamentals of, of meteorology and, 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 and high-quality science-based service delivery, but also in teamwork. Because as we all know, you can be on a radar team, but you got to have that great teamwork for it to be effective. That requires a very strong leadership, listening, um, and, and, and collaboration in a way that really brings ideas together so that we can take the cutting edge science and apply it in the highest quality of, of, of services. These are specialists 
in not only the radar assessment and the warning decision making, but also in diagnosing the mesoscale environment, which provides boundaries effectively on a reasonable set of scenarios for subsequent convective evolution and hazard production. And what they're doing in these Google Meets is they're looking at GR analysts, they're looking at the mesoanalysis, they're kind of the, as, as Ken mentioned, the, 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 in the earpiece of the, of the quarterback, and they're providing guidance on warning decisions to the receivers at the local weather forecast offices. And this year, you know, the, what we've done amongst the Pueblo office, Topeka, Bismarck, and SPC, is we've effectively passed around the receiver role to the different offices um, with providers at those offices to really test this out. What are the challenges? What can we do? How can we maximize our ability to, to, to really you know, tap into the expertise on these on-demand radar teams? We were very fortunate right at the uh, final hour to have um, Pleasant Hill join us as well as a receiver. Um, and, 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 and really test out the equipment that we're, that we're using in order to help facilitate um, this, this SME infusion onto these on-demand radar teams. Next slide, please. All right, who are the receivers? They can be anyone. It could be you, it could be absolutely anyone. It doesn't have to be. If you don't want it, there's absolutely no requirement. The idea is it's a resource. It's available for the provider to be able to on demand provide that guidance, that second pair of eyes, that second opinion um, when it comes to decision making. Again, we may think we can do it all on our own. We may be able to, you know, press the buttons and make make the critical decisions. But think about the continuum of excellence when it comes to what we can do together. I, I acknowledge there are some people who absolutely do an outstanding job. We all have the tools in order to do that, but we can always do even a little more ramp up that level of excellence when we're able to be willing to open our doors to help each other out and to accept help. And, 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 and I can say for myself, when I've done that, and it's been a challenge before, you know, sometimes I've gotten to the mentality of, well, I, I can do it all on my own. You know, I know for myself that when I reach out for help and I can say there are some warning decision makings that I had made that even held off on that Harry was there to provide that additional confidence, that guidance, that SME, subject matter expertise to help me do a better job as well. And that was so important in order to make some, some, some even better decisions. We would have done great, but we can do even better. Next slide, please. So the providers, um, they are the ones providing that expertise as, as Ken had talked about the offensive coordinator in the ear of the quarterback. These are the people constantly training, doing West cases, studying the mesoanalysis, contributing to the radar meteorology field, um, bringing in all the cutting edge science, working together, and most importantly, developing those leadership skills to be the best servant leader on their team that they are joining at any office on demand to not overrule people, not to force people to do something. That's not what we're talking about here. It's not in, intended to be an oppressive style way of getting my, my way or the highway. It's about how do we build consensus with the unknowns to help build the confidence together using that expertise to provide the highest quality of service. The providers do not take away the final warning decision making at all. They're, they're just the, they're, they're ear they're in the ear of the quarterback, the offensive coordinator in the ear of the court, uh, of the quarterback. And uh, that, that's their role. They're, they're helping to complement, provide highest quality services. Next slide, please. All right, so what, you know, what do the providers do? They're promoting that continuous conversation. We know convection is evolving continuously. It's, there's, there's, there's changes, fluctuations that can be subtle, but given the mesoscale environment, have a huge impact on hazards. And so that conversation to acknowledge subtle changes, you know, helps me get outside my own box. It helps me kind of be like, wait a moment, there's this elephant coming. I need to focus on this when I've been, you know, potentially one tracked and Harry helped me out with, 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 with that to really help guide the process through that continuous conversation. Um, they're helping to answer the question, do I warn or not warn? To warn or not warn? Um, all also to keep warning, you know, sometimes the, 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 the um, inertia of messaging can make us feel compelled to keep doing what we're doing. But there might be strong signs 
that we need to stop warning or start warning. And they might not be the most clear and obvious, especially in, in, in very potent mesoscale environments. And helping switch that messaging inertia is absolutely key to being able to be ahead, um, not just catching up to, but ahead of important clues. It's to assist in polygon shaping strategies. You know, it's not always follow the right moving uh, super cell motion vector for dealing with mixed modes, evolving modes, and the way we fan out the polygons, how far we go, durations, all of those little details. When we're getting some input on those key decisions, and we're we're accepting that 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 you know collaborative way of thinking, we really can achieve a lot of those challenges or, or overcome a lot of those challenges. Um, at a higher quality level. What to use with IBW tags, magnitude is always a challenge. And, and it can be very helpful to talk that out real quickly. Um, and that continuous conversation permits, enables that. Um, screen sharing can occur where the, um, the, the provider is able to watch everything on the AWIPS display using Epifan in the Google Meet. And they can, as the provider, share back with GR analyst screen sharing, for instance. So we can really look at features together to help with that collaborative decision making. Um, address the connection between, as I mentioned, the mesoscale environment that's dictating the subsequent storm evolution. Again, and that goes right into how we shape the polygons, the duration, the fanning, the magnitude level, et cetera. This is not a process where the providers are drawing the polygons. They're providing guidance, but they're not drawing it themselves. They're not making that final warning decision. They are not. They're providing support, just like in their, the Central Region RMA chat room. You know, it's, it's not those who are providing that expertise that are, you know, doing the messaging for the office. They're providing the context. And this is done in a very more one-on-one -on -one method. They're not telling the office what to do. There's no my way or the highway at all with this. And there's no judgment or questioning of the final warning decision. They're on the team together. It's a, it's a team on demand. All right, next slide, please. Core values, we've already talked a lot about this. Expertise sharing, mutual aid, which really is, 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 is taking the whole region concept, whole agency concept. This doesn't need to be just central region. This can be where we're acknowledging the expertise all across the agency to help us out. Now, while this is not specifically addressing work-life balance, the idea, just the overall idea of, of, of opening our, our, our minds up to different ways of thinking about things just promotes a better, you know, a, a, a better environment where we don't have to expect to you know, do all of this on my own all the time. We could do really, really well and excel at a much higher level when we're helping each other out. And that just helps the overall work-life balance. Um, environmental awareness is absolutely key and very much a part of this to warn or not to warn. IBW assessment, um, this, is, this is very much a collaborative um, endeavor when we're bringing these radar teams into any office and really aiming for top quality service. So that's the background. Next slide. Um, and so really, as I, you know, some of this is kind of repetitive from what I had talked about earlier, but it's really addressing the idea of the distributed field structure. In other words, going across our boundaries, going across our local office boundaries, across the agency to bring expertise into Excel services. This is really on a continuum from, from the central region remote mesoanalyst concept Meso analyst boot camps to the warning time scale, and it's and we're already doing this with other program areas. You may have heard of Savvy Supplemental Assistance Volunteer Initiative, where we're able to help each other out with any number of of, of different tasks across the agency, and also um, where you know some people are, are 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 better Spanish speakers than others, and so bringing in the Spanish speaking in order to help individual offices provide that that multilingual. Um, services is embedded within the multimedia assistance in Spanish program. We're already doing this in multiple areas, and this is really a very organized extension to the warning times, convective warning time scale. Um, and 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 so this is very much an investment in collaboration and really making sure the collaboration is emanating from that 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 grounding of expertise. Next slide. 
Um, again, a, a lot of this is, 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 a, is a repetition, but the main point here is when we're talking about convective warnings, we're talking about some of the most complex, high profile, life and death influencing mission critical decisions that we will make in our careers. And so when we can open our walls and we're willing to open our walls to incorporate that specialized expert skill sets and niche area expertise distributed throughout our field structure, we can achieve even higher levels of excellence and top quality service. And um, this is this is allowing us, this is already shown throughout our proof of concept that we can reach a much more optimal solution of service delivery when we do this. And this can be extended to many different service areas as well. Um, not only convective warnings, but what we found through these on-demand radar teams is there are other extensions to other components of the collaborative uh, process. So let's uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, what the we've already talked about here, we're not centralizing warning operations to one location. Um, and 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 I believe that this I'm going to pass to Stephen Rodriguez now, who is going to talk more about what the convective mutual aid concept is not. Thanks, Ario. <clears throat> you know, kind of to, to Ario's point, <clears throat> excuse me, and even like how Ken kind of led into it, um, you know, just kind of kind of reiterate some of the points that. Uh, Probably both, you know, what the convective warning mutual aid is, and, and kind of what it's what it's not there. And you know, the, the first bullet there, the myth that you know, similar to forecasting, and Ken kind of touched on it that you know, warning operations are going to be taken from us. You know, centralizing the warning operations. You know, and, and that's just you know, that's just a total myth. You know, through and through. You know, as you've seen, you'll, you'll continue to see in this presentation uh, that the convective warning mutual aid program it's about support. It's about supporting the individuals, our forecasters, supporting the office as a whole, and supporting the partners in public. And that, nothing's definitely not being taken away here. We have the, the local knowledge and they'll need assistance from the outside, you know, and that's you know, definitely, definitely false. Yes, there's local knowledge and that is definitely needed. We, we need the, the local expertise, the knowledge within that, our, our CWA to, to definitely excel and to provide top quality service to our partners. However, when we're, talk, we're talking about the, the best service possible, um, then why not seek, you know, any and all support necessary to do so? And then once again, you know, Ariel points that, you know, the diversity of solutions, bringing in diverse perspectives, it's really just a win all around to reach that ultimate, uh, that optimal solution. You know, it's scared of being told of what to do or even being judged, you know, and that's kind of something that, you know, initially, you know, being presented with this and working through this, something I actually kind of thought about, you know, sitting at the warning desk, having somebody quote unquote watch me or maybe monitoring, you know, and that's definitely not not the case there. You know, you know, you know, maybe I was apprehensive at first about it, or you know, as you kind of learn about it and kind of hear about it, something that you might think about in the back of your head. But as Ario noted, these are professionals, these are our SUs that are, are really kind of our providers. And our SUs are there to support. They're so there to develop and build individuals, build and develop our operations, elevate operations and our services. You know, and that doesn't change with this program. And they were to continue to assist with warning operations, provide insight into environmental analysis, storm interrogation and warning strategies. And ultimately it's really almost like additional on the job training. Uh, the, the fourth myth there, the officer will not need the current staffing profile um, in the future there. Uh, once again, the, the convective warning mutual aid program is really about support and insistence with improving operations. And having this added individual will not replace any local office staffing profiles or support. And then lastly, you know, for the, the last bullet, are you seeing that there is not excellence at WFLS already? And it's definitely not what is being highlighted and with this program. If anything, we're, we're highlighting excellence all across the board from the WFOs to our national centers and bringing them all together to meet the mission. And with this strong team approach or, or strong region culture, we then have a solid team that not only meets the mission, but elevates our services. Next slide, Harry. You know, and when I when I think of what convective warning mutual aid is, you know, I, I really can't help but think about one of my first mentors in the weather service, Ron Prezvalinsky. Uh, for, for those of you who may not know who Ron was, uh, which I, I hope you do. Uh, Ron was a very intelligent, talented individual whose expertise seemed to have no bounds. He was a, a leading expert on many foundational aspects of our science and what we do in our agency, 
when we're talking about, you know, quasi-linear convective sy systems, bow echoes, QLC tornadoes, you know, and just radar operations as a whole. But he was more than that. You know, he was the ultimate teacher, mentor, friend who sought to advance the science, build individuals, and improve operations. And so with that being in mind, you know, what if you have Ron Prodolinsky working with you, guiding you, and teaching you, you know, virtually to assist with operations? Think about that expertise you would have with you, guiding you, supporting, supporting you. You'd have that strong teacher, that strong mentor. And the support that, you, that you'd have assisting with warning operation, providing insight into that environmental analysis, storm interrogation, and warning strategies. And with the support, you'd ultimately have a more informed and trained staff or team ready and capable to meet the needs of any potential hazard or situation. And to me, that's the goal of the Convective Warning Mutual Aid Program. Thanks, Ari. All right. Thank you very much, Stephen. Really appreciate um, your acknowledgement of, of, of the role that, that, that Ron played in effectively bringing this into the local office structure, the ideas that we're extending that to a Google Meet session effectively. And I really appreciate all of your comments, Stephen. Thank you. Chauncey, why don't you take it away with the beginning of our testimonial session? Yeah, I would love to. So I had the wonderful opportunity uh, to participate in the very first uh, convective mutual aid that we did with WFO Pueblo. Uh, I got a chance to work with Mike and Clint one-on-one -on -one, uh, or one-on-two -on -two as part of a warning team back in August. Uh, but really, one of the things that I want to emphasize for my testimonial here is that really I felt like I was working with the whole office. Yes, I was working one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two with Clint and Mike back in August. Um, during our first initiative for this or demonstration of this, but they really integrated me into the full office. And if we go to the uh, the next slide, um, what we'll see is that <clears throat> this was sort of the screen. This is how it looked on my end as a provider back on August 15th. And what you see there is you see AWIPS in the Google Meet. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, I believe, but we use the Epifan software so that I could see the AWIPS that Clint and Mike were using. Um, and they were seeing, I was seeing what they were looking at. And I also left my tabs up there. Obviously, I could share with them, and I did as well. During this event, we focused a lot, especially early on, on sort of the environmental aspects, as we've talked about earlier on, kind of trying to anticipate, not react, what was going to happen with the convection. We actually started back at the initiation phase and eventually worked through where we did have a storm that we warned on ultimately uh, and then made some decisions to not warn on eventually as well or to let a warning expire so we really worked through the entire phases i was able to focus a lot on the environment the satellite imagery what our buoyancy and shear space was where the boundaries were again providing little bits of information to mike and clint talking to them throughout this to make the decisions to for us to anticipate together Obviously, I could pull up GR Analyst, and I did at times to show them that as well. Maybe some radar image features that I was noticing to really kind of support their radar interrogation on the ground, and then ultimately making team-based warning decisions. But I want to go back to that those first two bullets, really, uh, on this slide to really emphasize just how integrated I felt with their team. And really, honestly, we opened the Google Meet, and we left our mics open for several hours as we work through this event. And it wasn't like you expected, like you're in a Google Meet where you have to having a meeting, right? And you feel like you have to talk the entire time. No, this was like me sitting in operations with Mike and Clint and with the rest of the Pueblo staff. So as we saw something, or as we had some conversation, we would point things out, we would talk, we would banter even. When their evening shift came in, they joked around with me, just like they would joke around with anybody else coming in on an evening shift. And again, so I was fully, I felt fully integrated as a provider, which really helped my comfort level, really helped me to be able to feel like I could share what I was seeing and what maybe I was seeing and, and you know, maybe things that we can anticipate together. That fully integrated teamwork, it really happened because we had this open flowing communication like we were working beside each other. So if we go to the next slide, ultimately we made a couple of warning decisions and our very first decisions to issue warnings is we have this near simultaneous decision to issue both a flash flood warning, which you see being drawn up on the screen there. Again, that's my perspective. That's what I see in the Google Meet. 
I can actually see two panels from the AWIPS display at Pueblo. And yes, hazard services actually on the right hand side drawing up the flash flood warning. We actually issued both a flash flood warning and a severe thunderstorm warning at the same time. So Mike was working on one of them, Clint was working on the other one at the same time. But again, we had open mics so we could kind of share that knowledge back and forth conversationally. They were working on drawing polygons. If there were things that I could see um, that I could provide some input on to help with the team-based decision, I could do that. Um, even as we check through the text, you can see hazard services, the text up on the screen there. And if we go to the next slide, again, the other aspect of this was the severe warning, um, which did verify with about 30 minutes of lead time, by the way. Um, and they were both verified. The flash flood warning also verified. We did follow-up statements and again, once we had the warnings out, we continued to assess both from the radar standpoint together um, with the radar interrogation, especially being driven by Clint and Mike, but me being able to provide some input here and there and trying to keep the bigger mesoanalysis perspective, but also downscale to the storm scale. What does the mesoanalysis mean for these storms in the next 30 to 60 minutes? So we were able to continue warnings. We updated polygons and issued SVSs together, which is what you see there on the right-hand screen. Warned in, again, what I saw on my end um, as the provider from their AWIP screens being shared continuously. Overall, again, emphasis here being, I really felt integrated into the team. So thanks for letting me kind of share my perspective. And I know we're gonna hear the receiver perspectives here coming up next. Thank you so much, Chauncey, for all of your passion with this. I, I meant to introduce Chauncey, as many of you know, as the Science and Operations Officer at National Weather Service Bismarck. Um, and earlier our speaker, uh, and, and Chauncey was a provider, as he mentioned earlier, Stephen Rodriguez, a lead meteorologist at National Weather Service Pueblo. And uh, we'll, we'll, we're gonna continue hearing from both receivers and providers with up next, I believe we have Mike Garbarolio and uh, he's receiver coming up. So Mike, your turn. Excellent, thanks for having me on. Good morning, everyone. So just like Chauncey was talking about, I'm gonna I'm gonna be giving you guys my perspective as one of the early receivers for this for this new concept. And you know, one of the things I really wanted to touch on was that the mutual aid doesn't just happen during the warning operations. Uh, one of the most important parts, in my opinion, of this process was actually prior, well prior to convective initiation in our area, where two even three days out, we were part of a of a Google chat. And we would discuss, you know, the potentials for, for mutual aid opportunities in the coming days. And one of the most important decisions we actually made in this process was our start time. Uh, we had been going back and forth on the uh, relative timing of convective initiation over our planes. And what we decided was that, you know, if convection's gonna go up around this time, why don't we start chatting why don't we turn on the Google Meet and start looking at things maybe an hour or two early? And that actually allowed for, for a, a couple of really, really positive things to happen here. Uh, the first was that we had some time just to go over some pretty in-depth mesoanalysis discussion, um, not just between me and Chauncey, but also with Clint and the other people in the office, just like he was saying, we were all pointing things out, getting ready for the near storm environment that afternoon. And not only that, but as some of you may know, Pueblo's uh, forecast area is, is fairly complicated. We have mountains, we have plains, we have valleys, we have infrastructure, we have, uh, you know, uh, vital uh, roadways that, you know, typically storms can influence with outflow, rain, hail, visibility. So it gave us a lot of time to introduce Chauncey to ourselves, because this is the first time we had ever spoken to each other. And then it gave us some time to familiarize uh, Chauncey with our forecast area, with all the people in operations, so that by the times, you know, by the time storms actually started popping up, Chauncey was rolled right into our operations. And and throughout this whole process, just like he said, he was really just another part of the team. He was another person on staff providing expertise to the entire ops floor. When we saw something, we'd point it out. People were you know, shouting across the room and Chauncey could hear them just fine. It, it really was like he was just sitting in the desk next to me. And so th given that, that nice startup time, you know, yeah, by the time things got busy, yeah, Chauncey was basically just here. So it's not limited just to provider versus receiver. This is really 
a good whole office concept that you can take advantage of. And it's important to know that, you know, starting and timing is, is a big factor here. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So just some of the noted benefits that, that I personally saw as, as a newer med, I've been here for a little over two years now, and so, some of the noted benefits of this process that I've, that I've been sort of reaping over these past months, you know, using this diverse expertise from around the nation, around the agency to start building good habits. This starts all the way back through early mesoanalysis, pre-storm analysis of the environment, all the way up to polygonology, where we start talking about, you know, how far do we take this out? Do we leave this city in? Do we take this city out? I could be looking at AWIPS and taking vertical slices while Chauncey is sharing his, his GR analyst or the SPC mesoanalysis page with me. We can be looking at multiple things simultaneously and really just build a more complete picture using these more diverse skill sets. Um, one of the things I personally noted was that this really shines through in these kind of marginal environments. I'm sure anyone who's worked a warning desk has can really know that sometimes these slam dunk events where you have, you know, 5,000 cape and 60 knots of bulk shear, you kind of expect what's going to happen in a linear sense. But sometimes these more marginal events can really trip up even the most experienced forecaster. And so giving the right push in these complex warning decisions, really having that outside perspective can really help build really good habits when it comes to warning decisions in these complex environments. Uh, another, another great benefit that, that I, we've really been seeing is camaraderie with the other offices. It gets so easy in such a widespread agency to kind of sit in your bubble. I'm just going to do my warnings and go home. We're talking, we're exchanging information. We're like he said, we're bantering, we're becoming closer and building this camaraderie around the agency. So it's it's really good for the people with the different skill sets. You get to know these people and, and you know become friends and, and increase our quality of service through these relationships, this trust, and this really tight-knit sense of teamwork beyond our office. So overall, at least for our warning decisions, we've been seeing a really great quality of service increase here. Mike G is one of our newest meteorologists. Well, I should say, not my new office, but my former office, uh, one of the newest meteorologists at Pueblo WFO. And I, I, I can't thank you enough, Mike G, for all of those points. What you really are getting at is also a cultural consideration about how we look at each other as all being together, not competing against each other with this, but all learning from each other and working together and how this facilitates that. I, I couldn't have stated it any better at all. And thank you, Mike, for all of your perspectives. Um, Clint, uh, Clint's a lead meteorologist at WFO Pueblo and has uh, been a receiver, I believe, multiple times. So I'm gonna pass it to him now. Hey, thank you, Ariel. Uh, yeah, this is Clint from Pueblo. Um, you know, I had the, uh, the the opportunity to work with uh, both uh, Chauncey and as well Harry. Uh, it, both experiences were very great. Um, you now, just you know, I'm going to rehash a little bit of what you know what Chauncey's already said and what Mikey G's already said as well. But you know, in just to di dive in a little bit deeper of like kind of the storm that we're working with over on uh, on 815 with Chauncey you know it was a you know kind of a, a classic post severe season setup for our southern Colorado area we had a high shear low cape environment um, you know just not enough moisture to boost up those cape values quite high but we had good shear and I'm not sure if people are familiar with uh, this might be more you know popular in the storm chaser community but you know we were dealing with that Palmer divide magic that we deal with over on northern El Paso County and you know in even similar setups that I've seen in the past you know I've seen things that we've saw on radar drop you know one and a half inch hail just really quickly in these again high high shear low cape environments and that's exactly what we were dealing with and you know I think one of the you know the the, the critical moments that uh, we, we really hit during that day and this is again this is the day with Mikey G and Chauncey all together um, is the issue uh, the decision not to issue a severe thunderstorm warning sure we had uh, we verified a warning we verified a flash flood warning as well but you know it's also important that we've we, we found out that you know with some you know KDP analysis that it was likely just a lot of small hail that was melting the KDP values were quite high 
and you know i think this brings in the the the, uh, the perspective of thought you know we have um you know all these differing people with differing backgrounds together um you know it's kind of like a human ensemble of thought and you know when i'm on shift as a lead i truly truly believe in the in the uh, the, the, the paradigm of having a, a a radar team and you know to that day it was mikey g and i and then we we're lucky enough to have a subject matter e expert uh chauncey and on it as well and again just com uh, compiling all that human ensemble of thought to, 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 to provide the best service possible for our, our public and core partners. Um, you know, uh, similarly, as Mikey said, I think the, the biggest benefit that I see to this are on more marginal days. Um, in Southern Colorado, we have a lot of marginal days. You, I don't think you ever see us in some sort of, you know, anything greater than, you know, uh, 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 we've never really ever been in like a mar or not a marginal risk. I'm sorry, we'll never see us in a high risk kind of situation. Um, so you, you see us in a lot of slight risks, but those slight risks come with you know very strong winds or the isolated large hail. At any rate, I see this being uh, really beneficial for those marginal days as compared to to a higher risk day. So just relaying again what has been said before um, on nine two when I worked with Harry. Again, this was another one of those high shear, low cape environment days, except the storms didn't really pop up. And so, you know, uh, Harry and I, we got to ha have a lot of conversation about, you know, the tech, uh, uh, the tech of about what the, uh, the convective warning mutual aid is about. You know, we decided that we probably need a better microphone to enhance the, uh, the interactions and uh, whatnot. So, you know, even though we didn't have weather that day, uh, we still had good conversations on how to push forward with convective warning mutual aid. Um, you know, it, it, looking at all the positives, there was a bit of uh, a communication breakdown between our first shift, and this is the one with uh, Chauncey, and you know, this is just full spectrum kind of thing. You know, communication is really necessary if you're going to adopt this. And so with the, uh, you know, with the, the incoming evening shift, the R shift coming in, they weren't necessarily aware that uh, we had this going on. Of course, if this becomes more common, that that will alleviate itself. But you know, there were some communication issues between the convective warning mutual aid folks and then the evening shift because they came in thinking that they're going to issue warnings and stuff like that, which wasn't really the case. Uh, we took over. Um, the other thing was, you know, the common theme was it felt like you know uh, the aides were in the office, like. Um, they were part of conversations. I, I recall, I can't remember who else was on the desk with us, but uh, a person doing the long-term forecast, you know, he was also giving input and he was just across the, the office and it was all just kind of symbiotic in a way. Like it just, it was just like working in a normal office. It, it was great. So I, th I think that's all I have to, to add on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clint. Really appreciate that and, and, and all of your um, experience just in multiple cases. It's really great. We've actually had about, I, I think, at least a half dozen or so um, opportunities for these provider-receiver combos. So um, next up is Harry Weinman from the Storm Prediction Center in Norman. I just want to say a couple words. It, it, it was really incredible to have Harry join this and, and representing the Storm Prediction Center as we all recognize the Storm Prediction Center comes with world-class expertise in convective meteorology. And to be able to harness that and help support local office w, uh, WFO based warning decision making was really incredible. To, I myself benefited greatly from it. And so um, just thank you, not only to all the offices of, we've already had talk, but also SPC for joining us right up front. So I'm going to pass it to Harry now, who served as a provider for me as a receiver. Great. Thank you, Ariel. So we added this little uh, text here just to kind of, again, reiterate that anyone can benefit from this service. Um, obviously, as we all know, Ariel has tons of experience in convective warnings and mesoanalysis. And, you know, even someone like me that's um, very passionate and, you know, Ariel happens to be my mentor, um, I was able to really help him with this service. So um, this testimonial for me, um, just some of the highlights here to warn or not to warn, we talked about that, some of the screen sharing of relevant data. Again, as you all know, when you're in radar operations, there's a lot of data to look at. So it's easy to get tunnel vision and having someone in your ear 
I'm just pointing out ACAR sounding and describing the moisture versus the wrap sounding. It's a big deal in helping enhance the service. Open communication. Um, I added this be curious. That's a slogan that they use in the Pueblo office. And, you know, during radar operations, it's, it's critical because you, you see something, you say something. Um, and then I'm not going to rehash the rest of this. I think we um, went through plenty of that. The warn not to warn. Will the storms weaken, intensify, all the benefits. So uh, my approach here was I am going to just quickly walk through kind of a simulation of the event that I worked with Ario and, um, and how I felt that the provider receiver relationship enhanced the service. So um, this was the first collaborated WFO SPC warning um, that we're aware of at least. So um, here I'm highlighting a storm over their, um, the, the plains in uh, Colorado and Pueblo's area. So you can see that's uh, collaborated severe thunderstorm warning for that supercell um, tracking south here. Um, we discussed polygon size, shape, orientation, um, you know, impacts um, and duration. So a lot going on there, but we do it quickly. Um, and we got that warning out um, with really good lead time before uh, getting into those uh, population areas there. Um, so as the storm continues south, you can see that uh, trimming of the polygon to you know, get people out of that warning that don't need to be in it. Again, using environmental trends, storm evolution. Um, and again, this is all guided by the provider and per performed by the receiver. So really just enhancing that service to make sure um, we're keeping up with all these um, crucial decisions. Um, here I'm pointing out a decision not to warn. Again, as we all know, sometimes it's a harder decision to make um, not to warn than to warn. Um, so between the conversation Ariel and I had, I noted that the, where the storm was initiating, it would likely be undercut rather quickly um, by the larger scale cold pool. And then Ariel having the vocal expertise of the terrain um, also reiterated that as these storms continue south, the to topographical influences um, would also help that cold pool surge south and undercut convection. And you'll see how this evolves. Again, continue. To chime in real fast at that point for that eastern storm near Rush, you know, it, it very much on the fence with that. Um, and it was it was right around marginal severe and thinking about what was going to happen with the within the bounds of uncertainty, that discussion really helped give the confidence in that case to hold off on a warning given the acceleration of the outflow and undercutting nature down slope on the south side of the Palmer Divide. You know all on my own without having the discussion it'd be a lot harder to get that confidence and make me more likely to want to warn and 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 that would be false alarm there so that was a key decision point and also i'll just say from my experience this western polygon a lot of splitting action going on with that and some of the initial iterations that i would have drawn up may have been a little bit too narrow and harry is looking at that acars data and saying well might want to add a little bit more area here take out here and that really helped get, give the confidence to have an appropriately scaled warning. Excellent, thank you, Ariel. And then again, so continuous updates to the warning, just again, providing that highest quality service that we possibly can, having a second pair of eyes and um, continuous conversation um, in order to uh, really enhance the service overall. And you can see how this warning really wor is working out really well with the splitting and local intensification and you'll also notice um, you know north of rush you'll see what happens with that storm to kind of reiterate some of the things we were talking about here as that storm's undercut um, reduce the false alarm up there um, again this is another very critical point um, is, is the decision do we keep warning um, here we have a you know it's still marginal severe um, but again talking about the topographical influences the downstream environment um, all those things, it's very hard to look at all that on your own when you're making these decisions and you can start going into that tunnel vision. But having that second pair of detailed eyes, a third pair um, in the radar team to really boost your confidence that, um, yes, we can let this go. And um, you'll see here um, what happens to the storm. Um, again, gets undercut. You'll see that storm in rush completely gone now. Um, reduced to false alarm there, reduced to false alarm um, as the storms are heading toward the radar there and uh, with no downstream warning. And once again, um, so everything really worked out. And I think this was a great example of just a successful, um, a successful case here. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Harry. I really appreciate you joining uh, this, this, this growing movement. Appreciate it. Um, Paul Woolen, the Science and Operations Officer at WFO Pueblo. Um, we're going to do a quick Epifan demo so you all see what this looks like. Uh, Paul Woolen is, uh, um, has done a lot of the work in helping get the technological um, capabilities set up. And we have this at each office that enables the screen sharing from AWIPS onto a Google Meet. Uh, Sue community probably well aware, and you may already have the Epifan um, that allows the um, projection of the AWIPS um, screen onto the local PC. So Harry, I sent you a Google Meet with the um, link where you can pull up um, the uh, Google Meet where Paul's going to be showing. Paul, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Harry, it's just in the chat from me. Oh, just from you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll put that. Yep. All right. right click here. on that. Yep. And we're going we're gonna to zone in now to Pueblo's AWIPS. And I'm going to guide Paul Woolen through a warning decision. So, Paul, make sure. Are, are you up? Excellent. And everyone, we're in practice right. mode. Pumpkin. So I just drew up a hypothetical warning. We have really clear weather here, but um, so the question is, what do we want to do about Lamar? So you would you would guide me then what we would probably do for Lamar. So for example, you might tell me to move it back, for example, and not include Lamar before we issue the warning, or else um, to expand the warning, etc., to to include the city, for example. So this is the benefit, and then not only that, but we can also look at other things in AWIPS. So for example, we could bring up a uh, visible visible satellite imagery of Colorado. So we could look, also use the AWIPS data to do some mesoanalysis, for example. And then there's other things we could do with uh, this meeting as well. Not only is this probably good for convective mutual aid, but for, for many years, we've been wondering about how we are going to do, um, um, you know, uh, uh, graphical um, interactions with other offices, collaboration. So here, for example, this is just the Google Meet. So during this, you can also bring up other important things like so for example, if I wanted to um, share, um, so let's say we're talking about winter weather operations or QPF, I could bring in something, for example, um, um, QPF forecast from the WWD, for example, or else I could bring up other things like, for example, the Q QPF forecast, for um, Q, for WW um, from the WPC, and then if you really want to get nerdy, you could even talk about other things. For example, you could talk about the quasi geostrophic omega equation. So this is a tool that's not only probably really outstanding for convective mutual aid, but probably for just graphical collaboration with other offices and maybe even WPC, for example. Great, thanks, thanks, Paul. Appreciate the demo. Um, very powerful for sure. Uh, Epifan's um, setup is extremely uh, useful and has many potential applications. So it looks like we lost Ariel. So um, Harry or Chauncey, one of you will have to pick it up. Yeah, uh, no problem, Randy. Um, so hopefully we've generated um, some excitement out there uh, for this potential initiative and hopefully you're wondering well what next uh, so we have actually visited uh, with central regions leadership about this um, with Randy with Ken with Sally um, to kind of develop sort of a, the first steps for a path forward um, and first and foremost we're going to hopefully continue collecting examples and best practices from the couple of offices uh, including SPC Harry at SPC that are uh, initially involved with this Project so Pueblo Bismarck Topeka we're looking for some more severe weather events uh, to probably capture some some examples and best practice 
But really, as we go forward into 2023, we're going to start talking about what the path forward will be to expand this program. And ultimately, we really want to stress that in collaboration with Central Region leadership, um, this will all be coordinated with Central Region headquarters, with The Rock, and of course, with Nuisio. Um, to really chart a path forward here. And ultimately, a working group is expected to be developed in Central Region to really address the logistics and lay out the path forward. Ultimately, we want to expand this, of course, to other providers, to other receivers, additional offices. We're going to work with MICs to help identify what those additional receiving offices will be um, and when we can kind of expand so that we don't expand too quickly at once, but we know that we want this path forward as part of all of this, a measured path forward. And of course, we want to develop an application process to, for additional providers, for the folks that, out, that are out there that want to be expert providers to integrate as part of teams with these offices that want to be on the receiving end of this. And so as that application process is developed, it'll really focus not only on expertise, but on the teamwork aspects of this. As you probably gathered from all the testimonials today, the teamwork side of this is, is really vital to all of this. So that'll be part of the process that's on the application side. And ultimately, we want to work strongly with the MICs to develop recommendations about who those potential providers can be to really systematically chart a path forward for this. We want it to be successful from what we've seen so far. There's a lot of opportunity with this program, as you've heard from all the testimonials today. So we want to work on expanding it down the road, but again, coordinating to make sure that we do it diligently. So. And it looks like Ariel has returned. So I'll turn it back over to him. Thank you for your understanding. This is the reality of giving a guest speaker series while PCSing to the Pacific Coast. So I appreciate everyone's patience. Thank you, Chauncey, Paul. I'm not sure what happened there. And uh, sorry, I just dissipated. I'm not sure where in your presentation I did, but I'm sure it was amazing. So um, really, I, at this point, I just want to thank everyone who has been involved in this from all of the work with STI um, at Central Region Headquarters for working so closely with me on this and being supporters of this, Bruce Smith, now the Grand Rapids MIC for all of your work and mentorship with this, and then Randy Graham as the division chief, all of your support and, and, and open-mindedness with thinking how can we push even further to, to, to progress our services, to Bismarck, all the staff there, um, to PICA, and of course, Weather Service Pueblo, um, for your willingness to, to be open to this. Storm Prediction Center, thank you so much for joining us right at the front and Pleasant Hill uh, for joining as well. Um, and, and lastly, I want to say a few words. Um, you know, Ken Harding's leadership was absolutely pivotal to, cha to challenge all of the MICs and HICs to, to think big. Think about, you know, what were we doing now, but what could we do be doing to do even better? that really enables transformative leadership. And it's that inspiration that's so critical to open the doors for us all to work better, to strive for a higher level of excellence. And that type of inspirational leadership, I, I, I benefited from and we all benefited from to be able to, to really work together to, to, to provide something even better. We already do a great job, but how can we work together to make it even better? And so with that, thank you so much. I'm gonna make a run for the coast now. It's been the tr most tremendous honor getting to, to grow as a leader in Central Region. I, 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 it's, 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 it's been from the bottom of my heart an incredible experience that, that I will be so proud of all of the con connections and relationships that I've been able to make with all of you. And I will always cherish those going forward. So all the best to everyone and I'll see you all later. Hey, Pass it back to you, Randy. Yeah, thanks, Ariel. Thanks, everyone. Uh, outstanding discussion, outstanding presentation. Um, if you have questions or comments, please raise your hand or type in the questions pane. Um, got a couple things here. Uh, Bruce Smith said, human ensemble of thought. What a great, great way to summarize the benefits of this approach. Really liked that phrase. Um, and, and one thing that I would just like to share, and you kind of touched on this, Ariel, like, I think one of our great strengths as an organization is our distributed field structure. We have science and service outlets all over the country. We also have expertise distributed all over the country. And so it just makes so much sense to do, provide mutual aid um, and share those areas of expertise. Like you touched on RL, that we're not, we can't be experts at everything. We have uh, certain areas where we're strong and certain areas where we're not as strong. 
And so leveraging each other's expertise to provide the best service that we can to the public is just such a, a way forward for us as an organization to better utilize our human uh, re resources, our knowledge and our capacity. Um, so wonderful presentation. We do have one hand raised. Aaron Johnson, you are on mute. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear me. Yes, sir. All right, well, excellent talk. Um, and really just for some perspective here, that this is a concept that the TWIP now CWIP has been pushing to create really since the onset of the group is excited to see portions of this come to fruition. You know, in particular, one of the main concerns we hear from people is that they lack comfort or experience with using more cutting edge analysis and, and need experts, um, you know, guidance or assistance. So I, I think this really can help that. Uh, and, you know, really for many, I, I think this was said several times that the key is knowing when not to issue a warning. Um, you know, I think people get panicked or afraid of something and they need somebody else to help them. And so I think it's really critical in helping reduce things like false alarms and while still minimizing missed events. And so, you know, I, I do that feedback. You know, I, I think most of you even know this, various components of this um, kind of warning ops mutual aid concept has actually been tested uh, via individual requests with uh, formerly TWIP, now CWIP members to provide real-time input on storms for several years. And so um, even the, the multi-office COBRAs training that John Stopcott and I delivered back in September illustrate this capability to have a, a SME kind of help guide individuals with less experience in interpreting cutting edge concepts that can improve the warning decision away uh, you know, such that we're getting to more prognostic analysis. And so, you know, I, I, one thing I just, comment here, but I'd like to see is this working group partner with the, the CWIP to avoid redundancies that could exist because we've actually been doing some of these things individually for several years without a lot of people knowing it. And so um, just some comments, uh, great talk. I love the, the idea. I think it's a long time coming and, and definitely I'd be an individual that could uh, throw my hat into the ring for helping. So anyway, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron, and really appreciate hearing that there's already support and uh, progress kind of out there. And uh, really, really good to hear that 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 interest is already there. Um, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thanks for the for the comments, Aaron. Um, we did have a, a question come in from uh, Alex Kroll. Uh, it says, was the provider in an office with access to AWIPs? If using AWIP, were there any issues with radar multiple requests since the SBN doesn't provide all tilts of non nearby radars? Um, I'll, I'll let Chauncey and Harry um, follow up some of this, but I believe that they were not using AWIPs, they were using GR Analyst um, for their analysis and then watching the AWIPs display using the Epifan system that's plugged into um, the uh, PC and Google Meet. So Harry and Chauncey, if you wanna um, elaborate some more on this and any other providers. Yeah, that's exactly right, Ariel. I actually did this from my, my home office um, with GR2 there. I um, found myself more uh, not sharing. Uh, it was kind of a process of figuring out what worked best. And you know, that was kind of the beauty of this test bed was is it good to share? Is there too much sharing? Um, we found that really keeping the Epifan running and and the provider watching the AWIP screen for the majority of the time was really beneficial. Um, so that's at least the way I did it. I was home and did not have access to AWIPs and it didn't um, it didn't negatively impact anything for me. Yeah, my experience was exactly the same, actually. Um, so I was actually at home as well, and using the Epifan, I watched the AWIPs um, from the Pueblo office that was using GR. And just like Harry said, we actually found that, for the most part, I didn't share a ton. I, I was occasionally sharing my screen, mostly to show some mesoanalysis kind of stuff, but really, we just kept the Epifan that was displaying the AWIPs in the Pueblo office open pretty much the entire time and discussed more than me actually sharing anything in particular. And that we just found out as we went along, just like Harry said. Thank you. Anything else, Randy? Any other questions coming in? Yeah, thanks for those responses, uh, Harry and Chauncey. Um, I am not seeing any other questions at this time. Alex says, thank you for the response. Um, wonderful talk, uh, a bold initiative. Um, love your leadership on this, Ariel, and you know, taking a 
you know, sometimes you have to be bold and, and, and for us to move forward as an organization, things like this are needed. I'm just very excited about this concept and, and we'll be talking to everybody about what it's going to look like coming up in 2023. We'll have some conversations about that and hopefully we'll have a lot of excitement and people that want to jump on board. So Great. thanks to all of you, your whole crew, Ariel, for the presentation. Outstanding. And, and, and thanks once again. Really, it was a great opportunity to speak to everyone today. Head to Los Angeles now. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining uh, this week's uh, guest speaker series call. And everyone have a great Wednesday. Take care.